at someone who was helpless, hopeless, lost in the addiction, shackled by the by the bondage and chains of of darkness that just would not let me go. Mm -hmm. What I want to what I want to say here is. I didn't know what the reason was for then. I, I didn't question it because in a weird way, I enjoyed it. But then after I start, after I stopped enjoying it, it became, it owned me. I was, it's for me, it was something, it was kind of a bittersweet because I was, again, I, I didn't want to live. And I think it was after my grandfather died is when I took a deeper dive and I just said, well, this is it. I was in such deep pain and sorrow and mourning. I couldn't go back to my grandmother's because I was really sick and they didn't want me around. My stuff was in the backyard or in the... Hello, everyone. This is Karina from Break Fear, Find Freedom. And today I've got a beautiful guest, Richard Ozuna. Richard is a model, but it's so much more than that. Um, so let's dive right in and speak to Richard and discover some exciting conversations. Hello, Richard. How are you today? Hi. Hi, Karina. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, we've known each other for a little bit here now, um, dating back with um, with Marika and Dino, and that's how we all kind of connected. And we've 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 known of each other throughout this time. And um, I'm really honored to be on this on this podcast. I'm really I'm I'm really glad to be to be here with you. Um, I feel that, you know, sharing a story of survival, if you will, a, a story of of one's active addiction going 35 plus years um, in active addiction to now holding on to 21 years, one month and some change is simply one of the most incredible feats that I've been able to accomplish in my lifetime. And you're looking at someone who was helpless, hopeless, lost in the addiction, shackled by the by the bondage and chains of of darkness that just would not let me go. Mm -hmm. What I want to what I want to say here is. I didn't know what the reason was for then. I, I didn't question it because in a weird way, I enjoyed it. But then after I start, after I stopped enjoying it, it became, it owned me. I was its puppet. Mm, mm. I was the one that would answer every prayer. And when I let go and moved on to the other side in walking the straight line of sobriety, and that was in 2003, April 10th, 2003. That was my last, that was my last day of, of consuming any alcohol, cocaine, meth. Dropped everything. I just had to wash everything away and just, I'm done. And for me, it was something, it was kind of a bittersweet because I was, again, I, I didn't want to live. And I think it was after my grandfather died is when I took a deeper dive. And I just said, well, this is it. I was in such deep pain and sorrow and mourning. I couldn't go back to my grandmother's because I was really sick and they didn't want me around. My stuff was in the backyard or in the alley. And I had no place to stay other than the, the dealer's house that I was staying at while I was doing his tile floor working solely for meth which was a sad shame and that night when i wanted to end my life early in the morning you know i had a 38 and i was ready just to end it i was just done i couldn't do it anymore i had no will i had no power i had no strength i had nothing left 
And so what I wanted, what I wanted to do, I was looking down my street at my grandmother's place, and all of a sudden this gust of wind, cool wind came over me. And it was that moment and that moment that I knew my grandfather was speaking to me. And I knew the spirits, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, whatever you believe in, me, it was my universe. It was a universal prayer that just showered over me. And from that moment, I never looked back. I chose the route to self teach, self-motivate, and used everything I can within my self-power to become and stay clean and sober. Um, I've always said, no matter how you recover, as long as you recover, as long as you stop using, if it takes AANACA, or if it takes um, a group, a sponsor, fellowship, if you need that, by all means, grab it, do it, use it. For me, I chose the other way, and I had a little, I had a little setback with it because people were not quite happy with the way that I recovered, and I found that very disturbing. But I understood because they are in recovery their way, but yet you should never, ever allow another human being to tell you how to recover. You need to find your path of recovery that fits you, that works for you. Once you find that, then and only then can you start your your recovery. Thank you. I love that. That was like a really a, a, a great story all in a nutshell, but I have to dive deeper, okay? Um, I want to go back um, for, a, for a bit and just, you, just ask you, like, how did you fall into... Um, addiction in the first place what was the trigger at that point that that or or did you just fall into it like a lot of people you know like a lot of us we fall into it and we don't realize until we so deeply in and the devil's got us by has just got us within the chains so what happened right. before you right yeah um I don't remember exactly the year nor do I <clears throat> remember the date uh of how old I was but I was very young. I had major, major allergies, anxiety, everything. A feather would fly across the sky. I would break out. My neck would get big. My tears, my sinuses. I, I was allergic to foods, avocado, cut grass, pollens. Every spring was, and it, it, it just, I was, I was going in for shots. I must've been in elementary school, you know, probably one through six, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And my allergies became so severe that when smog came in the summertime, um, it was hard for me to breathe. And so I would gasp for air, like, mm -hmm. you know, wow. and I, I would have to lay on the couch until we, until we can get to the doctor, because I, I don't even remember. All I know is the shots that I would go in for twice a week. I would, I would have to get to to clear my 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 airways. Mm -hmm. I was a very very disturbed child in that way. I was always in the hospital. But what happened was um, they finally prescribed to me these little white pills. To me, they were cross tops. And if, for those of you that don't know what those are, it's probably 90% ephedamine. Okay. Okay. So it has the same euphoria and the same addiction qualities as meth. So as a young child, I was in La La Land when I took these things, laying around and like all in a wonder, like, whoa, but I can breathe. I can breathe. The sad thing about it, you're looking at um, an eight-year-old, seven-year-old, whatever age I was, nine years old, jonesing, withdrawing when I didn't have it. Mm -hmm. Because I was only allowed to have one if I was having a, an episode. Mm -hmm. 
can imagine at that young age manipulating your 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 mom and trying to get more saying that something's wrong when there isn't how crazy is that so that's when my first inkling and my first knowledge of addiction set in quite quite unusual for someone to be a child to be going to the medicine cabinet and then for your mom to have to hide them from you that's wow. just bizarre it is and and with that um because we know uh, with uh, the, the the addiction personality you, you learn so many mani ma manipulating te te techniques uh, oh, tactics yeah. so yeah <laughs> How did that change your life as well? I mean, now you had a new lease on life. Obviously, you could breathe and whatever, but you also had this desire for other things, right? Oh, how yeah, did that yeah. change your life? Well, after that, after that episode went on, my allergies still stayed the same. I continued with my shots until I was older. Um, and I never, it never really crossed my mind after that. So I guess you could say after that age, I was in recovery then. <laughs> I was clean and sober then. And, you know, my allergies came and went. And I, I remember my early, late teens um, going to dinner, having avocado with, with someone at a restaurant and, you know, getting it. All of a sudden, my, my airwaves and neck and everything just collapsed oh. i could not breathe my eyes my face my neck started swelling there was just everything that i was allergic to and cats I couldn't have any cats because I, i'm just allergic to allergic to their their hair the the hairs the fine hairs mm -hmm. um so my allergies continued but in junior high probably junior high coming into high school is when i started to experiment with marijuana Mm. friend of mine behind me his brothers were older they were growing plants they they were like the bud con connoisseurs of that time in the late 70s okay um so it was normal to go over there and smoke a joint smoke a bong and you know hang out have some beer then it started going every morning going to school high coming home for lunch getting high after school getting high mm. um mm. And, you know, I mean, I, I've done some good things during that during that process because I was always in baseball. I was always playing music. So I was always doing things. I was always doing things. And then after I realized that the marijuana was not for me because it made me really tired and made me paranoid, really. I think it was more of a peer pressure thing, like everybody smoking and okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't for yeah. me. It wasn't for me. I was not that. I was not that guy, and um, it just it it just wasn't for me. And then someone introduced me to cocaine, and that's when I said, "Wow, what the, what is this? This is magical. This is this is amazing. Where do I get more?" <laughs> And the hunt would be every weekend in high school. All of a sudden, I couldn't find coke, but someone had this new method of doing coke, which was rock cocaine. I tried to break it down and snort it. Didn't work that way. They, they kind of laughed and said, no, you do it this way. Mm. They gave me a piece of foil and I smoked it. And that's what took me on a journey that I can't even, can't even imagine. So it was the Coke meth. It was the Coke rock cocaine that really took its toll on me. Got tired of using Coke, got tired of smoking crack cocaine. And I was introduced to meth. And that introduction, the first time I tried it, I thought I'd snort it like cocaine. And I was up for a week, hallucinating. Just could not. Wow. I, wow, yeah, it was. 
So it was a, con a constant new thing in that 35 to 40 year run, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not, I'm not even including from the time I started at, at, in my early, early, you know, childhood, I don't exclude that, but I share with it that that's where it started. My active addiction with, with meth, coke, and alcohol was roughly about, like I said, I could be wrong. It could be close to 40 years. Mm -hmm. I know it was way in the hell before I was 18, 19, 20. So I know it's over 40. So I have a lot to speak of. I have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. I went to school a lot. I went to school a lot. And I was educated well. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to use any of the things that I learned in my up and coming <laughs> as work skills or on my resume. Oh, excuse me, what have you been doing for the past 40 years? Well, do you really want to know? <laughs> so, I mean, right now, Karina, I can I can laugh about it. And I don't want people to get me wrong. I don't I'm not laughing at the one that is inactive that's suffering right now. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying here is I have to put a light spin on it on my end because it makes it much more palatable in a way for me because I remember when it wasn't. Walking the streets, losing everything from cars, clothes, shoes, everything and anything I can give away for raw cocaine, that was what I was doing. And I didn't care. I did not care. The underlying truth behind all that is I hated myself. Mm -hmm. I did not love myself. I did not respect myself. I wasn't happy who I was. I wasn't happy with the color of my skin. I wasn't happy with the, the, the texture of my hair. I was in a white environment, which meant I have siblings that are half Mexican, half Caucasian. I'm Mexican-American, I mean, Hispanic, but the Mexican-American kids in my community did not take to me because I didn't speak Spanish. And then the Caucasian, the white kids didn't understand because it was, I was very different. I was darker than everybody. Mm, 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 mm. So it took me a long time to really focus on really I've got a lot going on. I got to figure this out because something's happening. But there is nothing more that I can say at this moment how proud I am to be Mexican American, to be a Latino man in a in in America, and to be able to be a model for up and coming men and women, children of color that want to get into modeling, get into movies and do the things that they're, they thought they could only dream of. And I get to live that. And I take that very seriously because I want people to understand that if there's anything that I'm doing here, you can do it. There is nothing that can stop you other than you. And that is what makes my day is knowing that I'm able to do something and have and share something because my pain, my misery is going to be someone else's new life. It's going to be their awakening. And if my tragedy can become their awakening, I'm here. I love that, Richard, um, because I always say this Break Fear, Find Freedom podcast is always about if, if I can impact one person, if I can change, if one person just gets the message and makes a difference in their life in a positive way, then the job is done, right, which is beautiful. Um, I'd, I'd like to just um, go back for a moment and s say how you spoke about how one day you, you just you were ready to end your life, okay? Because it comes, it obviously came to a point where what happened besides the death of your, your grandfather and whatever, but what led you to eventually say, you know, I, I, I've had enough of this. What am I doing with my life? Yeah, and, 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 and that was that moment because I was living in this 
trash of an old trailer with beer bottles on the ground sleeping on trash because that was the only place I can sleep, the only place I can go if I wasn't walking around in the middle of the night. And I took a look at everything and I was in there, in the shit, in the crap and just, what am I doing? I have a bag of meth and I'm, and I'm doing work for this. I have no money on me, five, ten dollars to run down and grab a beer or two. What am I doing? It, I didn't want to change then. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to end my life. I, I was just done. I was done. I was tired of the fight because I relapsed hundreds and hundreds of times every weekend, every Sunday. Oh, yeah, I'm going to quit. That's it. I'm throwing my vials away, throwing my pipes away. That's it. I'm done. And that went on forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I knew... I knew I was at my end. It was either I was going to kill myself slowly by doing what I was doing and hope for the best. And I say hope for the best because that's what I wanted. I didn't want to be here anymore. I, I wanted this. I wanted this madness to end. <clears throat> so when that happened, when that moment came, I knew I was truly blessed. And I mentioned something here early on in the podcast. I didn't understand why I went through the hell I went through. And I, I, I have a thousand stories in that, in that timeline. But I know now why I went through it. Mm. I was chosen to go through this. I was chosen to go through the hell to see the dark depths of hell. To live about, to live and to talk about it and to help others. Yes. I truly believe that. Yes. I truly believe that. And I wouldn't change it for the world. Yes. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's beautiful to be able to go back. Um, and you went through it, which is amazing. And the amazing part is that even though you were killing yourself slowly, because, I mean, that's what, what meth and crack, cocaine, all those things do, right? Alcohol, whatever it is, you know, y you, you got to a point where you were blessed again by the light. Now, um, it's, it's also very nice, and it's easy to say it in retrospect, like, this was a blessing in my life. And I'm not um, trivializing anybody else's journey because everyone has their own journey. But to be able to go back and to say, you know what, this was a blessing, even though it was horrible. I saw hell. I saw the <laughs> devil. I saw yeah. the devil. The devil yeah. was there with me constantly. And I managed to beat it. I managed to win and I managed to come out and I managed to make a difference in the world, which is an amazing feat, right? So, and, 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 and just to add to that, you also can laugh about it, laugh about, you know, at yourself and say, wow, you know what, I did it. And, and, and it's not, and again, it's not jokingly about, not, yeah. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you because it's, oh. it's like, wow, yeah. you know what, I can laugh at the crazy things I do in my life and at the craziness that I did then and that I survived it and I'm here to tell the tale. So that's right. amazing in its own. It's right, right? Yeah, Richard? yeah. I, that's, it, your exact, your words are dead on. And, you know, the blessing of being able to go through that there was a reason I was chosen because I guess it showed me that I had the strength to go through what I went through yeah. to give me the strength to overcome and survive that. And again, at the end of the day, that's great that I do modeling. That's great that I do film. That's great that whatever is here is here, what people see. But what I want to be known for is someone that's helped others unselfishly. I share my, my pain with others so people understand that they are not the only ones that are going through it or went through it. Mm, mm, mm. They're seeing someone 
that it's changed their life is living on a on a path of of recovery the way he wants to and if i can give any hope to anybody out there to say hey i want what he has i want his sobriety then that's what i want to be known for and that's the most that would be the biggest honor to me when 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 i'm gone is the fact that i'm recognized for motivating others and helping others in sobriety and that's and that's a beautiful thing as well um to be able to serve others by by being an example which is is really beautiful and yeah. and of course i'd i'd like to um just go back a moment and say how did you fall into modeling anyway because you <laughs> you like you were in this in this you were broken like broken you just said you were sleeping on rubbish you had you had nothing ready to end it all okay um how did you go from being that person with a gun in his hand okay ready to to end it all like literally how did you go from there to here and i mean i know it's a long story but i just want some little tease I'm gonna, perhaps i i'm i'm going to give you i'm going to give it i'm going to give it to you in in a in a little condensed nutshell um i would say and again uh, my years and my memories of years is very off here and there except for my recovery day i know the exact day month year here we are here we are um i would say about 13 years ago i was discovered by a casting agent and this casting agent loved my look I had a go to big beer down to here all my jewelry up to here my medallions and everything i was out to dinner uh she liked my look she thought that i would do great in a film called being american uh with christopher mcdonald lorenzo lamas sienna gilroy um so many great actors people that i watched on screen that was my very first film she gave me her card she goes i i love your look we're looking for your look <laughs> we're shooting in a couple months they picked me up they fed me they brought me back and forth to the set in 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 they they arranged everything got my first film credit as a terrorist on being american which has been released overseas in europe um that was my first first go and then from there film started coming over and over uh four more other or five more other full feature films and i got to work with um i i got to work and and witness great actors and i look at this now and i look at everything here and some of the actors there that worked with el pacino johnny depp big actors and great character actors and i'm studying them cuz i'm just watching them how they get into their character and that's what that's what interested me in becoming a character actor so when i when i did a couple when i did a couple characters i i did two roles in one film i was a gangster in one imagine goatee beanie cross <laughs> khakis with my head down and i'm looking around Correct. and the director asked the director asked me hey he goes you know what we don't have anyone here to do um to be the news reporter and would you be you know could you do something with your can you just you know do something and you know or even just I'll I'll be right back. I went to the trailer, shaved my face clean, slicked my hair back, put my round glasses on, turtleneck and a jacket. I walked on set, nobody knew who I was. <laughs> I knew I had something there and I got my film credit um as the news anchor on this film. And I knew at that moment I was I was already I already knew that I can go into different phases of looks in one film and from there I went on to another film that I did three characters in Schism 
<laughs> so to make a long story short, the modeling came, the modeling came from, from film. March 2021, up in the Bay Area, we are shooting Trimmer, which is currently, finally, after two years in post-production, wow. I was filming up, I was filming up there, and there was a there was a woman up there that actually ran the Airbnb that we rented for our for our scene in this house. She loved my look. And keep in mind, people, I did not I was not one aware of my looks. I didn't walk around thinking I look like anything other than me. There were days that I just wanted to hide because I didn't like the way I looked. It's just recently I realized what I look like. And I'm taking it a little bit differently now, but you're looking at someone that don't, didn't even look at his looks. She liked the way I looked. She took a picture of me. I, to me, it was one of the most ugliest pictures I've ever taken because it showed me lost because I was already at my wits end with this film. It, it was just way, way exhausting. But when she told me, she goes, I'm going to send this picture to Europe. I'm going to send it to a friend of mine. I see you in Europe as a model. What? Really? Huh. Wow. I couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, fast forward a little bit. They booked me on, um, they booked me for my first shoot. We do that one in Santa Monica, California with Daniela Gonzalez. It ends up in an Italian fashion magazine. Um... The, fashion, the uh, Style Researcher, that was my first magazine in Italy. And then all of a sudden, I find myself in New York on another photo shoot, pinching myself, sitting on a stoop in Brooklyn, New York, <clears throat> 2022. And many photo shoots, so many I can't even count. But at this time, I, I'm five times published. <laughs> Yeah. Four magazines, one cover. And when I saw the cover of this Marika fashion magazine, that's when I just like, what? What? So it was someone that saw something in me that I didn't see. And sure enough, yeah, in Europe, in Australia, Paris, France, Paris, France, Italy, Australia. Wow. wow. I've been published. And for me, that right there, I, I, I don't take that lightly. I take that very seriously because in all my bios, and I think I might have mentioned this to you before, in all my bios, my sober story is there. And there was no, no other way I would do it unless I could tell my story. Yes, I'm not yes, in yes. it. I'm not in it for fashion. Even though my film Trimmer, Schism, were based on my character, the way I dress. This was something that I just knew that it would give me another opportunity as well to share with the sober community that this is for you. And I dedicated my last magazine to the ones we lost, the ones that overdosed. Mm -hmm. the wow. ones that have taken their life due to mental health, alcoholism, drug addiction. I know firsthand going through it, I, I've never overdosed, but I've had to witness my son going through that. Mm. But to make, a, to make that story even better, is that my son graduates on May 29th on my birthday with one year clean and sober from a oh. drug rehab program that I'm going to attend and I get to pin him. Wow, congratulations going, on that. That's beautiful. Going through everything that I went through with him, he just didn't realize that I was his biggest fan. He didn't realize that I was the one that knew he could do it. I was new, I was the one that knew that he was greater than he can ever ever see himself. And being able to mentor to my son means the world to me. And for him to recognize my my time in sobriety by my own son that is going through it himself 
is simply like just amazing and um huh sorry yeah, sorry so Richard. that's sorry um i just wanted to ask you a question how's it different now because you know we always talk about the 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 victim the person the the addict or the the substance abuser whatever you um who's right. who's in the in this in this problem and and you've got the family that rallies around or doesn't how is it different for you because now you on the other side and you have become the family and you have to look and you know because you've been there you know the story you can see the patterns you can see it all and yet how difficult was it for you to to actually watch and just do the best you can and how different yeah. was it for you yes yeah it, yeah it was it, it was it was extremely difficult um I, I i couldn't stop what i was doing because i was supporting a family um so when i when i became clean and sober i moved up north and i ended up going back up with my wife and 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 kids I knew, I knew that I wanted to be better than, I knew I wanted to be something that they deserved and I wanted to be the father that they, that they needed. And so when my son got into it at, at, in early 14, 15 years old and started getting in trouble with the law and, and getting in, and started to use and went from pills to, to, to marijuana, to drinking, to um xanax and just other things that were going on and then when he overdosed the times that he did and the times i had to pick him up and get him out of parties because he was passed out and i can't say poor me i can't i can't say anything other than i was already conditioned to understand it mm -hmm. being able to understand it it took its toll on me but I was better to provide him with information that I thought he didn't hear. So every time that I was talking to him about it and, and I thought it was going through one ear and out the other, he was truly retaining that for this time right now because we talk about it. Mm -hmm. So for me to understand and to be supportive of him, and I don't know, it's very difficult because I had, I had so many people that, um, that allowed me to do it, that, that enabled me. And I think I might've enabled him for, for quite some time because, you know, I, I was trying to be there for him. I didn't know how to be there for him other than monet monetary and, 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 and things like that until there wasn't. Mm -hmm. So you go through that mistake and there's no right way, wrong way. I just knew that there had to be a different way. And I never disconnected myself from him completely unless he disrespected me. And that was the only time. But it was a difficult time. It was a difficult, difficult run. But again, being able to talk to him about it and for, and for actually for me to sit back and listen to him, which is even greater, yeah. is really something and a blessing that we get to discuss this now. We get to talk about this now. And I get to see him now, not in active addiction, frustrated, upset, mentally tormented. But now I get to talk to him because he's now got a sponsor. He's in fellowship and a member of AA. He has completely changed on the physical sense as well. Does not look like the same. He went in a kid and he's coming out the other end as a man. Mm. I mean, just unbelievable. And so we get to speak about it today. Wow, that's beautiful. And again, you know, you have the, the, the you had that experience so you could assist because a lot of times like i said it's the families don't know how to deal with with a person a person that's using 
there's no there's no support really out there because it's always about the, the person that is using. So you actually have um, two different ways that you can assist people, not only the, the for sobriety, but the families as well, where the families need support as well, and they need to be healed in a way so that when the, 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 the sober person comes back, then they're in a healed environment. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. And, and Karina, that, that right there, you just you just set a light off that I didn't I, I've never even thought of as far as me being able to utilize that portion of it to the families that are going through it with someone who's in recovery. I didn't look at it that way, nor have I ever presented myself like that, but absolutely true. Absolutely true. If there's anything that I can do for a parent, a brother, a sister, yes. um, um, a significant other of, of, of a person that is on that on that road. I've, I've dealt with a lot of people and I've talked to a lot of people about it, but I never looked at myself as one until you said that. Thank you. But yeah, that, you know, it, it, it affects everyone. Mm -hmm. It affects everyone. And I didn't know, like when I was going through it, I didn't know how it affected everybody the way it did until I found out it didn't affect them because they just gave up on me. Yeah. Yeah. And my family were not, my family, they weren't, they weren't into drugs. They drank. My 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 stepfather was an alcoholic. Mm. Mm. My my father is in, in my biological father's in prison. Wow. So you see, also... I got to talk to him. I got to talk to him for a little bit here. I haven't spoken to him probably in about seven months, but we connected because I called the prison looking for him. Imagine mm -hmm. that. Wow. I know how I was treated by my elder kids. They want nothing to do with me to this day. And after talking with the woman, Robin, in Brooklyn, and she is a editor and creator of this amazing sobriety magazine that deals with people incarcerated that are actually the writers they are the ones doing the stories. It gives them an outlet so they can share their genius with the world. And I asked her, here's my, here's my dad's name. She found him, gave me the information. I called the prison. Imagine, imagine that. A 60 years old, a 60 year old man calling the prison looking for his dad. A few weeks later, I get a call back from him. Then we started talking because we can only talk eight minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's kind of strange because there, be, there may be some people on on my side of the family that I'm really not close to, but may have something to say that I'm talking about this. There are no names in, included. I'm just giving you my reality. And for anybody to to try to silence someone's story, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. yes. It's all part of who I am. And if I leave out that part, it's not fair to people that are going through the same thing because they're, they're probably going through the same thing I'm doing. But I wanted to make sure that my dad knew that I, ha I have no ill will. I have no bad feelings. I'm not mad at you. I love you. I want a relationship with you from whatever time we have left. Let's make the best of it. Mm. I wanted I wanted him to hear that, but I wanted me to say it because it, I wanted to heal me because I wanted him to understand that I don't hate him. I wanted him to understand that no matter what he did not do, I still love him. And I think that the distance between parents and kids when they get older and people go astray because for whatever reason... It's the separation of unity when family decides to do that. Now, when people grow apart as husband and wife, that's one thing. When people grow apart because people don't see eye to eye, fathers, kids, mothers, kids, generations of people have separated because people are headstrong in believing the way that their way is right. Nobody else's yeah. opinion matters. We all go through it. This is nothing new. Um, 
I just wanted to be the difference. I wanted to be the change. And that's why I did what I did. And that's, um that took a lot of courage um to to do that, Richard, to to actually say, you know what, I, I want to make this change. And how much fear did you have um, actually making that call, like the fear of rejection? What if he hadn't replied? Or how would you have, what, what was going through your head when you actually decided to take that leap of faith? Yeah, you know, um, there was no sense of uh, sign of rejection I felt at all. I knew, I knew that he would want to reach out to me. Um, I just knew that. We we communicated we communicated a while ago uh, before he went to prison. He, he he was sentenced, I believe, to twenty five to life, and it looks more like life now than anything else. It's been over thirty some odd years, mm -hmm. but I I did get to see him early on when I was out of high school. Um, he would come around every once in a while with my uncle, so I knew he was there. I knew he existed. Uh, just money was given to me. There was nothing else given to me. Um, I don't know. I just knew at that moment because I had a very bad experience with my son when I tried to reach out to him via his his grandmother. That was the only person I knew that might be able to contact him because I really wanted to speak to him. I wanted him to understand some things that happened. It wasn't all it wasn't all bad, but there was a reason. And when when she decided to take him from me and keep me completely away from him 100%, you know, a lot of stories were told to kids and it's not right. Mm -hmm. And when I received a call from him with a lashing, every cuss word, every, de every demeaning word you can imagine a man getting from a son, well, I received that. And it was at that moment when I called my father, I knew that he was not going to deny it. He was not going to do anything, but he did listen. Not only did it touch him that I was able to find him, it touched him that I said what I said to him to let him know that I don't hold you responsible. I don't hold any ill will. I don't hate you. I love you. And let's, let's see what we can do moving forward. All we can do is move forward. Yes, yes, I love that. And how much healing did that come um, for him, and but for you as well? And and how oh, yeah. did that and influence also perhaps the healing between you and your son, in some sense? Yeah, yeah. It was all I know. It was something that I felt in my heart strongly. And when the heart leads, you just follow. Yes, yes it's the only way, right? It's the only way. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we're going to end on that note because we'll have to have a follow-up on, on, on this conversation, Richard, because there's just so many strings that we've just left and we need to go and dive deeper because if you watch my podcast, you know that that's all part of the, the, the fun of all of it is to dive oh, yeah. deeper and to just see where it goes. So, Absolutely. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, watch out, sure. everyone, for the next episode because it will just get more and more exciting as we dive deeper and we just expose Richard. Oh, you, you, you've, you've come to break fear, find freedom, right, Richard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I'm looking forward. I'm really looking forward to this. And I believe that, you know, there's no way that you can actually truly get – get something out in one, one hour setting. This has to be a prolonged series that would have to truly go. And I'm, I'm gonna leave it up to you how you wanna do this. I'm in no matter how you wanna do it, how many series we go into where it just follows in, in succession. However you wanna do it, I'm available, I'm in. We'll just set the date. Thank you, thank you, Richard. So, okay. watch out for the next one, everyone. Thank you, thank you for being here. And um, we'll see you, you all soon. Thank you, Richard. This was awesome. I look yes, forward to the yes. next one. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Karina. <laughs> thank you, Richard. Okay, bye-bye.